Chris Watts. I'm doing my communication speech for uh, Brenda Armantrout. And uh, welcome to Broomfield, Colorado. About 70 degrees, and it's awesome outside, so welcome. I'm doing my speech on a relationship deterioration and repair. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. This is episode 6 in the Shakedown blog series. And in this episode we're going to interrogate a pretty obvious, straightforward aspect, but one that I don't think has really been spoken about very much, or I think if we have spoken about it, it's sort of um, been dealt with very quickly and then brushed aside. And what we mean is this physical transformation that we see from Chris Watts, where we see him in action on the um, relationship video from 2012. You see him on camera, you see how he presents himself, and then you jump to the events following August the 13th. You see him on the sermon on the porch and they're barely recognizable. You know, if you look at the title image and you, you look at the, the fellow on the left and the fellow on the right, it's very hard to sort of reconcile that, that this is the same person. And so the question we asking ourselves is, how did he go from that guy in the relationship video to, to that, to, to this person who looks a lot better, he looks a lot fitter, he looks a lot you know, more, more good looking and, and um, you know, handsome, I guess. And yet, I think the Chris Watts on the left is kind of a, a better human being for whatever reason than the Chris Watts on the right. The one on the right looks like he's a, a you know, perhaps a nice guy, right? But he's not. He's a much worse person than the, much worse person than the, the other guy. And so what happened there? How did he go from this to that? Now, I think there are two ways to address the question. The one is to say, okay, literally, what is going on here? And so you might say, well, you know, he used Thrive and he um, lost weight because of that whole process. And one can go through the sort of mechanics of it. But we're not going to do that here. We're not going to sort of talk about... Uh, his exercise ritual or him changing his diet or, um, you know, the fact that he was using so many of these Thrive patches, you know, two at a time or any of that. We're not going to talk about the, um, the you know, the biochemistry side. We're not going to talk about the, uh, the physical process and what is behind it. Instead, we're going to talk about what was going on What is the process governing all of this? In other words, what is the psychology causing this? What was driving this? And which came first? Did did, um, a kind of narcissism um, uh, bring this about? Or did this bring about narcissism? Which is it? And so that that is really the topic of this discussion. As I said, I don't think I've heard it too many times in the past. We tend to be quite flippant and say, well, you know, Chris Watts looked good, right? Um, But we don't really appreciate the process that was involved, certainly not the psychological process that was involved. And that is what we really want to look at in this episode. Once again, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do. You can click on the light blue icon on the bottom right of your screen, like, share, are you guys sharing? Are you, are you guys sharing on your networks, on um, Facebook, Twitter, whatever? Are you, are you sharing? Please do share occasionally. Leave a comment and <laughs> let's get started. So the communication speech on relationship deterioration, such an ironic title of all the things he could have spoken about. You know, he spoke about that. And we'll come to his speech in a moment. What I want to focus on in this episode is to some extent his body language and the Chris Watts we see without going into a lot of detail you know who is the Chris Watts we see on camera in this 2012 speech and there are a couple of just obvious things we see a bespeckled guy we see a guy who 
uh, is wearing glasses, right, is not wearing glasses in the um, Sermon on the Porch, which is, I think, a decision he made. He wants to present himself in a certain way. When he gives this presentation, obviously he's also reading some of it from PowerPoint. But besides that, he's also, he looks a bit different. He looks certainly a lot chubbier. Um, his beard is a lot more sparse in a way. Um, besides being chubby, you don't have any of that um, that silver fox thing going on. You know, he's sort of got a full head of hair and, well, a reasonably full head of hair, but he doesn't have that sort of um, mature sort of look about him um, that he has on the Sermon on the Porch. I'm not saying certainly by any means that he was mature when he gave the Sermon on, on the Porch, simply that he appears more mature because of the graying that's happened. He also appears a bit more groomed in terms of his beard and and his overall appearance and the fact that he's not wearing glasses. Um, but what about what about besides that? What about, you know, if you juxtapose the presentation, and again, it's not so much what he's saying, it's his appearance, his um, confidence in 2012 compared to 2018, six years later, what has changed? So I think part of it is is become a dad. He's, he's been married for six years. He has matured in a certain way, right? He's gotten to, um, you know, gotten to know the the family life scenario quite well. I mean, he was basically just gotten married at this point that he gave this video. Um, but during the sermon on the porch, something else was going on. And I think a big difference between the Chris Watts in the relationship video was he was basing a lot of that knowledge on theory, on something he'd read in a book, and the book is actually referenced. And I actually went and did a bit more additional research of the book and, and all that kind of thing. But the point is, what the advice he's sort of giving is largely kind of theoretical. It's not coming out of his experience. He does stick also very much to the script that he's gotten from there and very little of it is based on his own experience. And you might say, well, you know, that's fine. You know, it's fine to talk about relationship deterioration and, and communication out of someone else's experience. I don't think that's the case. I don't think you can speak convincingly um, in that way. And, and that, that was the point of this, this, um, this exercise for him. It was to show his confidence, to show that he has some insight and that he's quite an effective communicator. And part of that is being able to you know, stand on your own credibility, which, of course, he doesn't have any. He didn't really have any experience, or not any, but he had very little experience with, um, uh, with women at that point. Whereas when he's standing on the porch, I think he's feeling like he's got some game. And I think Shanann and others may have challenged him on this through the course of his marriage. You know, you don't have any game. You know, you need to stand up for me or whatever the case may be. And now, standing on the porch, he feels like he's got a lot of game. He can stand in front of the cameras and say his thing. And he's, he does, doesn't have half of the uneasiness that he had, you know, in that other presentation, right? He's not only prepared to stand on the porch and address questions from the media, he's also prepared to speak to the, um, you know, the officers, the various officers that come in, and he gives kind of a, um, you know, a version where, you know, he sounds, he sort of chuckles and he makes jokes, but you sort of get the sense that he's gotten a sense of himself. And I think a lot of that actually came from the, the wealth side, that, you know, in working with all these other oil workers, he kind of got a sense of confidence and of the way that men talk when they with one another. I think a lot of that came from there. And I think perhaps also quite a lot of respect and his sense of himself, um, perhaps to some extent esteem, came from his co-workers. You know, I think it was... To some extent, I think they did respect him 
as a hard worker and as, as kind of a good guy, um, which is why they called him the Silver Fox. I think there was a part compliment in that. And I think perhaps even part of that compliment was perhaps an admission or an acknowledgement of what that meant. The fact that he was, you know, quite good looking, you know, was that leading to something else? Did his co-workers recognize that? The other part of it is they called him Rain Man. And while that might be a compliment to some of some aspects of his memory, um, you know, if you look at the real Rain Man movie, um, played by Dustin Hoffman, you know, he was like an idiot savant, um, quite clever in terms of, you know, very, um, a very strong detailed memory, but otherwise quite an awkward fellow. And so maybe that, there was also a little bit of truth in that nickname for him, because Watts was apparently someone who could go to a well site, remember the coordinates, um, you know, kind of off by heart, and in that way, he was, he was quite different to the other operators. I don't think by any means he was some kind of genius operator in that sense. But I do think he had probably an above average recall in terms of things like numbers. We see that again when Coder talks to him and, and you know asks him about the passwords and usernames. And, and then he seems to remember all of that very well. Of course, he doesn't remember the... Um, uh, username to his bank. Uh, he remembers everything else. Um, but I think the other part of where you can see there's been this transformation in his confidence is where he talks to Coda, right? And he is willing to back himself in that situation. And if you think about it, Coda doesn't actually uh, break through on that first night. You know, he says, you know, some of these things sound like horse sorry, horse manure to him. Um, but he nevertheless, you know, he may he may sort of catch what's off guard here and there, but he doesn't really make any breakthroughs. And then the next day, Tammy Lee, you know, takes him through this exhausting polygraph. But once again, what's happening is the Chris Watts of the Sermon on the Porch is backing himself and he's still wearing the same clothing there. And he's quite... Um, cocky in the way that you know he is prepared to be polygraphed and he's prepared to answer the questions and even though Tammy Lee says to him you know um, you know right now we don't know what really happened but in a few minutes we're going to know exactly what happened and then he, he does the polygraph anyway the other thing is when he sees his father and his father recommends that they get a lawyer what still backs himself and he chooses to sort of contrive this quote unquote confession, right? And he thinks that he's been quite clever by, you know, putting the blame on Shanann when he's actually just been played completely, right? But the point that I'm trying to make is that he's become quite confident and and the the question is where did that com confidence come from? Now I think to address it sort of directly i think his confidence has really come f from two or three areas principally i think his confidence has come from the sense of fellowship the, the sense of camaraderie the sense of you know in where where one is working in a male dominated environment like the oil industry um he's become one of the guys right I don't mean that he's totally transformed and he's now totally, you know, um, going to go and watch football games with them and, and play poker with them. Just that he, he was far more socialized with the oil industry dudes than he was as a mechanic. You know, if you compare his relationship, say, with Jeremy Lindstrom, well, he had a lot more, um, there were a lot, there were, there were far more uh, people around him at the oil site and at the platform hub, right? And one, one gets a sense that his status went up a couple of notches in this environment where he was seen as a good worker, as a reliable worker, as a conscientious worker, and kind of a nice guy. And so I think he was quite well liked. You got that impression from his boss and from his co-workers, right? And to some extent, he had a little responsibility. He was a field coordinator, so 
he would sort of be um, coordinating with other workers around him and that would give him a sense of some social power, if you want to put it that way. So that's the one area. I think the other area, which I think is a very big area, although I do think that they are tied together, is Nicole Kessinger. Nicole Kessinger was one of his co-workers. She may have also noticed that his male colleagues um, respect him, like him, and also that he's different to them. He doesn't have their bravado, their hubris. Perhaps he's better, he had better manners than them. He was better behaved than them, was more of a gentleman than them, was, was kind and perhaps even sweet in a way. And, you know, whereas they might be quite rough and um, perhaps have a dirty mouth on them or whatever. And she probably, she she may have taken her cue partly on um, on the way that they held him in, in a certain level of high regard. Also, I think part of that was that he was, his appearance had improved, right, in the office because of his fitness, Right. And then I also think when she started paying attention to him, and, and I mean, even before they were in a relationship, even before something happened, I think um, he may have noticed her attention, noticed her, and sort of started to try to meet um, an idea of her expectations. He might have tried to raise his game in a way. And and what happened? She liked that. Um he paid attention to her, you know, they'd have conversations, she liked the attention, he liked the attention, and the next thing, apparently, she was pursuing him, and her pursuing him was, I think, something he'd never experienced before. He'd been liked during high school, but this was totally different, and I think the nature of her pursuit was also totally different to um, what can happen in high school. Not totally, totally different, but I think in a way that he was now, to some extent, able to handle, having been married for about six years. So I think you have those three dimensions. You have the dimension of um, his male co-workers holding him in relatively high regard for his standards. Nicole Kessinger, her, um, I guess, falling in love with him and pursuing him. And then I think the, the other dimension to that was, to some extent, having to perform on Thrive, having to just every now and then appear on camera. And, you know, if he wasn't practiced in 2012, he was, if if he was still awkward and uncomfortable, he was nevertheless fairly used to the idea of having a camera on him by 2018 because Shanann had demanded this of him f- so often. And he may not have been very good at it, but, the, but by the time... 2018 rolled by and it was August, you know, the idea of a camera being on his porch probably didn't seem completely foreign. And so that is how, that is, I think, the answer to how he went from this, this awkward sort of bumbling fellow with very low self-esteem, much lower than in August, to that. But at the same time, you know, I think the person that you saw, the sermon, making the sermon on the porch, the person you saw um, being polygraphed, um, the, the person that you saw at Dodge Correctional, the person that you saw being sentenced, all of that self-esteem was actually like a house of cards. He, his self-esteem had just been, you know, it was just being is- assembled. He was just getting a little bit more confident. Um, even Nicole Kessin just said, you know, he was still very introverted, but but he'd become a little bit less introverted during their relationship. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And so when he is trying to come out of himself, out of his shell, and then feels desperate and and desperately wants to uh, find somewhere preserving this fairy tale that he's got in mind, he then does something atrocious and gets caught and then basically throws in the towel on his own story. In other words, although he, he seems he's, he's arrived and he's confident and he's found his self-esteem, obviously he didn't, otherwise he would have gone through with a divorce. And alongside that, um, if he had the confidence to go along with a divorce, um, you know, um, you, you could imagine that he, would, he should have had the confidence to go along with a trial if, if it was 
you know, the, the circumstances were slightly different. What I'm, what, what I'm trying to say is the fact that he couldn't even um, defend himself in a trial shows that ultimately he actually had no confidence to begin with. Do you know what I mean? Also, the fact that he's confessed so many times, he was still someone who was trying to please other people. His locus of control was, to some extent, um, externalized. And I also think part of the reason why his house of cards collapsed, remember when he confessed, you know, um, Coda said, can you take us to the, the well site and, and, or can you have one of your colleagues, you know, open up the oil tanks? And he was appalled at that idea. He was... That seemed to be the first real show of emotion where, where he was really upset at the idea of what, what were his colleagues going to think of him. And he, he also even said, you know, to Cassie, please don't think um, any, you know, d don't think less of me. So he was very concerned what people thought of him. I think if he was a, a true narcissist, um, the fact that he thought so much of himself would have been sufficient, but he wasn't. He's quite an insecure person, quite a... Um, you know, an introvert, uh, an extreme introvert, and and so the other part I think that played into him throwing in the towel on his own story was Nicole Kessinger basically dropping him the moment that she realised what is going on, fully realised what is going on, and so when she dumped him, they really in his mind and in his heart there was no reason to, in a way, keep up appearances. But I think part of that was also the thing that was propping up his shaky self-image, his shaky confidence, to some extent, was Kessinger. I think her love for him gave him a certain amount of esteem. Their relationship, to some extent, gave him a sense that he has some game after all. And so when she pulled out of it completely, I think reality sort of slipped right back and Chris Watts defaulted to his original default setting which was of this introvert, this this guy that um, is very unsure of himself, this guy who essentially lacks um, a sense of self and self-esteem. And that's actually why I came up with the title Two-Face, is because it, in a very simple way, you see Chris Watts presenting a facade to the world of a normal guy. And meanwhile, behind the scenes, he's actually very, very introverted, he's a different person. And part of that person behind the mask turned out to be the person that did what he did, right? That's how separate those two things were. But he's by no means the only person that is two-faced or that wears a mask. Shanann wore the, the Thrive mask. You know, Shanann's mask was her social media. Nicole Kessinger also had a mask. Um, Nicole Kessinger was sort of the... Um, you know, the um, person employed at Anadarko, the, the co-worker, and then she had this other life with Chris Watts. So she also had that other mask. And, of course, that mask was revealed eventually um, when she did her exclusive with the Denver Post in November when she finally came forward and we finally found out about her. So that is really the subject matter for episode seven in the Shakedown blogs. Um, I'm going to be doing a special episode with that one where I'm going to be doing a live stream that will be on Sunday, taking you through quite a special episode from the Shakedown blogs dealing with this particular aspect, Nicole Kessinger, when we got to know her involvement or when certainly some of us started to suspect her involvement um, as early as the 23rd of August, so te just 10 days after this incident had happened. So uh, look out for that. That'll be during a live stream on Sunday at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So I'll be taking you through episode 7, but via live stream. So look out for that one. I want to encourage you to listen to the um, 2012 relationship video on your own time and then immediately after that listen to the uh, sermon on the porch and get a sense for yourself of this incredible psychological transformation besides the physical transformation but this incredible psychological transformation from 
um, the Chris Watts of 2012 to the Chris Watts of 2018 during the Sermon on the Porch. And I, I do think, just to address the question I've, I've made earlier, I do think part of the narcissism that comes from exercising and being in good shape certainly played into that. Part of that sense of, you know, I look good, I feel good, um, and people are responding more positively. I think that was definitely part of it. But I think far more than that was the sense of narcissism and esteem and ego that came about as a result of Kessinger noticing, you know, how attractive he was looking. So I think he got a sense of confidence in a way of false confidence um, first and foremost from Nicole Kessinger. What do you guys think? So I'm not going to take it any further than that. I'll see you guys again for the next blog in this series. Uh, that'll be Sunday, as I mentioned. So until then, I'll see you guys next time.